Welcome to CIVES and to the School of Architecture and uh, Planning at Morena State University. This is our fourth annual Design Health Symposium. Um, 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 I welcome all of you. We have uh, members of the AIA Baltimore and the landscape community and our colleagues in um, public health and colleagues from other programs. So welcome everyone and the many of our, our graduates. Um, as some of you know, um, this event is in continuation of our efforts uh, in the field of design health and more specifically uh, our, our projects on community, uh, on community health and uh, the design of, uh, uh, of community uh, health facilities. So first I would like to acknowledge, uh, uh, to, to make some acknowledgements. First of all, uh, the ZGF, uh, which uh, has uh, generously uh, sponsored this event, like our event last, uh, last year, uh, the ZGF Architects. Uh, and we have representatives of ZGF here, Susan, Lee, Sarah, and Sarah, and uh, Christopher here. I really appreciate uh, um, ZGF and our colleagues over there for their generosity and for supporting our design health initiative here. It's a pleasure for us to continue working with ZGF and strengthening our, um, our uh, relationship with them. And also, I would like to thank um, our colleagues in the AIA Baltimore, Kathleen Lane, and, and Heather is here. I don't know if David um, Watts is here. Um, and, um, and Zevi and uh, Nathan, who have been very helpful. So some of you may not know that this is just a two-hour event, but it really takes us probably five months to, to plan it. So sometimes, and, and, uh, and even with five-month planning, just, um, things happen and uh, the cameraman does not show up. So, <laughs> Um, I, I need to uh, thank uh, uh, my colleagues in the School of Architecture and Planning, uh, definitely our, our, our dean, uh, Dean Marian Akers, who is not here because she is out of state for an accreditation visit, and our wonderful um, IT guy, uh, Terence, who is our hero, who is, uh, expert, who is an expert in resolving issues in the last minute, and that's why uh, we, have, we can uh, record this uh, event and, and hopefully post it on, on YouTube like our uh, other events. And also Evan and, and Ms. Hashim who have been very helpful in taking care of logistics. I also need to thank our wonderful uh, program assistants. Naomi is here, uh, Kachi is here. Where is Kachi? Uh, Kachi is here. Yes, Tinashe, Jessica. And uh, where is Jessica? I think she's there, yes. And SRC members, and Charlotte, who's not here, and Colleen, uh, who's right here, who is the president of our Design Health Club, who has been an integral member of our Design Health Initiative in the last uh, uh, four years. And the good news for her is that she will be graduating this semester, although I'm not sure that this is really good news for us. Um, but um, uh, congratulations in advance to Colleen. Uh, she's amazing. So I also need to acknowledge my colleagues who are not here, but who have been always very supportive of our event. Uh, my colleagues in the public health program, um, Dr. Kamangar and Farin, um, uh, um, Farin Kamangar and Payam Shekhatari, who have been really supportive of our projects here. So now I would like to introduce our wonderful panelists um, who uh, kindly and generously agreed to share their time and their expertise with, uh, uh, um, um, to share their time and expertise with all of us. And, uh, and, and hopefully this conversation will continue and uh, will, will continue outside this room. So first, Eric uh, Alessia is a certified planner and, and a partner in Portugalis Partners, um, um, Partners Region and Town Planning Studio with over 24 years of experience. 
He has led numerous planning and urban design efforts throughout the United States and abroad. His expertise includes transit-oriented development, mixed-use town centers, urban revitalization, form-based codes, traditional neighborhood design, healthy communities, placemaking, and consensus building. He's, con he's currently leading the development of the Community Health Report Card, a case study tool that predicts the comparative health benefits and reductions in chronic disease based on a community's physical health, as well as the HOD, which is Hospital Oriented Development Model, that seeks to leverage one of the largest sectors of our economy into an economic development engine, a, a dynamic and resilient real estate model, an ecologically sound community, and a health-promoting environment. He has received several major national uh, awards, including CNU Charter Award and AIPIA Award. Thanks, uh, Eric, for joining us. It's a pleasure having you. Our second speaker tonight, our panelist, is Dr. Tracy Gersh, who, who has over 30 years of experience in the healthcare field, including many years as a clinical provider and as a senior leader in healthcare administration. Currently, she is the executive vice president and chief operating officer for CHI Healthcare, a nonprofit integrative um, primary care center that brings together the best of West, uh, Western medicine and other healing traditions to provide patient-centered whole person care. In her role on the executive team, Tracy provides strategic oversight of the organization's efforts to achieve its mission, vision, and values. In addition, Tracy oversees all clinical and wellness operations, as well as several administrative functions, including finance, human resources, and marketing. Prior to joining CHI in 2014, Tracy served in different leadership roles for overall 16 years at a community health center in Baltimore. The mission of this federally qualified health center is to provide compassionate, quality health care that honors diversity, inspires wellness, and improves our communities. And as you can see, all of them have to do with the topics that we will be discussing tonight. Uh, Raymond Gray is our next panelist, who is the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Trivergent Health Alliance, MSO, a uh, 220 million organization with 850 employees serving Frederick Memorial Hospital, Western, Memo uh, Western Maryland uh, Health System, and Meritus Medical Center. He also serves as the CEO of Advanced uh, Health Collaborative LLC, which consists of four major independent Maryland-based health systems with a combined total of 10 hospitals. Formerly, he was the senior vice president, chief financial officer, and treasurer of the Meritus Med Medical Center. He is the past chairman of the Board of Directors of Maryland Physicians Care, a past member of the Columbia Bank, Bank Board, a chairman of the Colonial uh, Regional Alliance Board of Managers, and treasurer of Tri-State Health Partners Board of Directors. Raymond has been a member of several committees of Maryland Hospital Association for many years, largely on the finance committees committee and the rate negotiation committees. Our last speaker who is going to be serving as a moderator for this panel, who is a friend of mine and who has been very generous in sharing his expertise uh, with our initiative at Morgan. And also, we were honored to have him as a speaker in our first year symposium, is Rolf Harstedt, who is the senior vice president and principal with CRJ Design. He applies his design and leadership skills to strengthen and grow the regional firm's East Coast uh, presence. 
With a specialty in healthcare projects, he has led the design and delivery of several major projects throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. Rolf began here in Baltimore in late 80s. He then returned to his native Midwest, where he and his wife, Kathleen, who is here, um, um, who is also our colleague at, um, at, at Morgan, has, uh, his, has um, had their own firm in Minneapolis for most of the 90s. The couple returned to Baltimore in the late 90s, where Rolf began his specialty in, in healthcare with HCN. Um, the nationally respected design firm HGA recruited um, Rolf in 2013 to build um, from scratch their healthcare studio in the DC area location. Rolf's projects have been honored by the AIA Maryland, Baltimore Chapter AIA, ASLA uh, Maryland, and AIA Minnesota, and his work has been featured in numerous publications, including Architectural Record, Healthcare Design, and Architecture Minnesota. In, in addition to his design and management background, his strong ma ma strategic uh, planning skills led his uh, largest client to date, Western Maryland Health System, to appoint him as the chairman of the board in 2016. Uh, a position he currently holds and will continue for two more years. So, so um, it's an honor to have uh, four of you here. And uh, just to give you an idea about uh, the format of this panel, I shared some general questions about uh, the, the theme of the panel uh, with, uh, with the speakers, and we had conversations with uh, with Rolf, and Rolf will have a, panel, uh, a presentation, and then uh, the panel will start. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, talk to Mohammed about setting the table for the discussion, and I thought the easiest way to do that is to do 2,500 years of healthcare history in about 10 minutes, right? <laughs> Okay, but what you'll find in this is essentially the old adage of what is new, or what is old is new again. So am I doing this right? I knew this was gonna happen. Let me get started. There we go, just that. All right, so very brief history of healthcare, healthcare architecture. And I think you'll find a, a, a running string of social, <coughs> the social contract that healthcare has. This is probably the first known uh, example of a healthcare facility, the Alespian Healing Temples in 500 BC in ancient Rome. Um, you'll recognize this is the, the demigod. Asclepius and his staff, which is still the symbol of healthcare today. What's interesting about this project is this is a wellness center. It had gymnasiums, it had uh, nutrition centers, and this is 500 BC. And they, so you're going to see we're going to come full circle back to this kind of healthcare. Uh, in, in, in Roman times, the hospitals were primarily for both the soldiers and also for their for their slave population. But you start to see um, this cellular approach to it. Now, the, uh, the other thing about healthcare, and what I'll talk to you about when the paradigm shift comes in, but really healthcare was all about taking care of very, very sick people. It wasn't really about, and in fact, almost before, before death, the place they would go before that. It wasn't really a medicalized facility in that standpoint. Um, Muhammad and I had, had several conversations about where real modern healthcare comes from. And, and probably the, one of the earliest examples was the uh, Bismarck stand in Baghdad in 700 AD. This is Haran al-Rashid, um, who's the leader at that time. Uh, it's very forward-thinking healthcare environment, uh, uh, natural light, again, more of a wellness focus, um, and started to pers or, or point to some things that were coming in the future, future as well. As we get into the Middle Ages, Healthcare 
started to become stratified between the poor and the rich. And in fact, that's, that's an ongoing um, theme through all of this. The poor people had nowhere to go except to the monasteries. And the monasteries took over the primary health care initiatives of that time. And you can see in this typical monastery here, the Bellu Abbey, how the cellular functions of, of the monastery itself became essentially a, 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 almost a, a hospital experience. Now, there's a show on, on BBC, I don't know, 20 years ago called Connections. And I don't know how many of you remember that show, but it was one of my favorite shows. And it was always about how something strange or weird happened that totally affected industry and life from that. These two women are probably in their own way responsible for modern healthcare. And this is Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn. Now, Henry VIII, in order to marry Anne Boleyn, had to get his marriage annulled to the Catherine of Aragon. Pope Clement VII, who was adamantly opposed to that, obviously, uh, excommunicated Henry VIII. Well, before this happened, all the, the hospitals in, in this entire region were the monasteries. Well, after the excommunication, Henry took his ball and went home, right? So he shut down all the monasteries in the, in, in the area, but then they, they had to pick up pick up that ball and continue on with treating the population. So some of the early hospitals in England from, from the, the period from the 1600s on, they, they start to become more institutionalized in the sense that there's, there's mandates to build, actually build hospitals. And these are still treating the very sick and close to dying population. Concierge medicine existed at this time. If you had money, you had a doctor come to your home. But if, for the poorer populations, they would be taken to these types of environments. Um, they started having specialty hospitals at Foundling Hospital in London in 1739. Again, you see there's a very common architectural theme to, to the hospital environment in terms of cellular organization, the use of natural light, et cetera. They tried to keep them as healthy as the environment as they could in some fairly unhealthy uh, urban environments at the time. First hospital in the United States, 1751, was founded by Benjamin Franklin in Pennsylvania. And University of Pennsylvania Hospital, this was their first hospital, correct? You know, uh, so UPenn, this is all over their website, uh, being the very first hospital in America. Uh, Florence Nightingale, Crimean War in the 1830s, fundamentally changed healthcare and how healthcare is delivered in, in the entire world. Um, her, she, she was a great champion of, of clean environments. I mean, most in, during the Crimean War, before she took over for the, the English forces, most of the deaths, and this happened in the Civil War as well, most of the deaths weren't caused by the combat, it was caused by infection and, and all of the scourges that came after that, right? So she was, she's called the mother or uh, founder of all nursing, modern nursing, and um, the outcomes after her interventions were incredible. Then you start to see uh, American hospital architecture now at, at the turn of the century, the 19th century. One thing that's, I think is very interesting from an architectural standpoint is how the hospitals really manifested their method of care. Now, at, at this time, tuberculosis was rampant in America. And most of the hospitals built during this time had these incredible porches attached to the hospital. Because, and you see, you see these folks reading their books out on the porch in the bed. This, this, this was a standard method of care in that time. And the hospitals themselves were, I thought, very handsome in terms of, of, of the way they addressed them. And actually, that was, I'll go back, talking about Cumberland, that was the original Memorial Hospital in Cumberland, Maryland, which was added onto about a gazillion times, and it, it got covered. <laughs> it eventually turned, tore it down. Um, it's interesting to hear history on, on, on the equity side of the, of the scale. So the first African-American hospital in the United States was built in Chicago in 1896. And this is the way, this is the way it was in the country at this time. Total separation of the races in terms of health care. Um, and, and there was really these, the, the hospitals that were built by, by the African-American community were, were actually quite modern and, and very well staffed. 
but still they were separate. Then 1946 rolls around, and um, those of you that are in healthcare worlds and understand that the, the Hill-Burton Act of 1946, this was, a, this was a reaction, this was a huge uh, congressional budget putting forward, it was at the end of World War II, everyone was having their babies, this was the start of the baby boom. There was this incredible need for hospitals across the country. And so they talk about here how they wanted to create 4.5 hospital beds per thousand people nationwide. And actually, a lot of the work you'll see over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years is renovations or, or uh, uh, raising of these hospitals. But uh, most of the hospitals that you're probably familiar with from when you were younger came from the Hill-Burton Act. Now, this was the sad fact, though, of the Hill-Burton Act. So it, it, the Hill-Burton Act Act had this social equity pact of, it, of having no, you, you couldn't discriminate on the basis of race from coming to the facility. However, they allowed them to build facilities in a separate but equal fashion. So you see in this mirrored plan here, you, you have the white side and the African American side. You see there's, there's the signage around. So it, even though the, the Hilburton Act was supposed to be a a more forward-thinking social pact for the health of the country, it still had this awful effect of racism at the time. 1964 rolls around, and, and the Civil Rights Act took care of that. You know, you, you no longer could have this separate but equal aspect to it. But also, this is when Medicare and Medicaid came into, into, uh, into the fold. And, that, and in terms of social equity, Med Medicare and Medicaid, and with all the bouncing around political football it is, that really is the safety net for a great deal of the country in terms of, of, them, of them getting good health care. There are, you see some of the other things that have been a bit under attack lately, but environment and consumer protection, all of these became part of, of, of our cultural fabric in 1964 from, from the Civil Rights Act. So then you get into hospitals the 60s. Um, they tend to be fairly institutional. Um, they, they're certainly more medicalized in the sense that they're curing people now. It's not just a place for sick people to go. Um, certain aspects like having a parking garage and a gas station as your front door is probably not where you want to go, but it's, it's <laughs> something's going on. Then you get in the 70s, and I wish Jeremy was here because Jeremy loves this kind of stuff. Um, this is Bertrand Goldberg. Um, he, he, he did the, uh, the Twin Towers in Chicago, the, the I'm like losing the name of it. You know, the housing, right? Anyway, so why not just take that and do hospitals like that, right? Well, anyway, so this is Brigham and Young's boss and apprentice women's in Chicago from, from uh, Goldberg. And they proved to be pretty unreasonable models for, for inpatient care. For one thing, it's impossible to add on to these. You know, it's just, it's like adding on to an egg. So, but the 70s were, there's some pretty crazy buildings being done in the 70s. As you get into more current hospital design, you're starting to see a return to some of the things that we talked about back in, you know, 2,000 years ago, which is, is bringing courtyards in, natural light, more of a healing environment. This was a project that HGA did in New Jersey. Uh, this is the healing garden off of the NICU. These are the types of spaces now that, are, that customers are absolutely demanding in healthcare environments. As, as we go forward. Uh, this is Western Maryland Health System where I'm, uh, the, the chair, as Mohammed mentioned. And, you know, think of the entry um, experience here as opposed to what I just showed you. You know, it's, it's, it's becoming more of a garden approach. Um, healthcare, it really is becoming customer driven and is really driven by the metrics that come out of how well the customer feels in your environment. So what's changing now? So um, the hospital I just showed you, and it's what you think of, of traditionally as a hospital, is the acute care environment. We're what you're seeing now is a lot of that care being taken out of the hospital, and we call this a continuum of care. So everything that, come, that happens before you get to the hospital, e-visits, retail pharmacy, ambulatory centers, diagnostics, those are, all, those are all projects that are very hot and heavy right now with all of the architects around here. 
but they're also taken care out of the hospital to a less, a less expensive environment. And then uh, post-acute inpatient rehab, skilled nursing, et cetera, it's all part of the same continuum, but what you're seeing is, is, is care coming out of that typical hospital environment and getting more into the community. Uh, so the forecast, so you're seeing a, a inpatient growth flattening and even dropping precipitously. Outpatient growth in the one below here is, is it projected to, I think it's even more than this now, but 21% growth over, uh, over a 10 year period. And this is affecting how we as architects uh, approach healthcare and also I, I think uh, it's availability to the greater population. Uh, you're seeing new project types. This is a clinic by a very good firm in um, Seattle, uh, Malin Architects. This is a community clinic in Portland, but you see how now healthcare is being taken out of that institutional environment and brought more into the community. And that's, that's a huge trend right now, is getting, close, getting closer to your constituency. Uh, project from HGI I did with them. This is a trend right now as well, conversion of community retail centers into uh, fairly comprehensive um, clinical and, and um, ambulatory surgery centers. You're seeing a lot of this getting closer to the customer, right? So you go on your, your shopping trips and there's a clinic at, at your target. Um, the wellness center, I showed you from 500 BC, a wellness center, this is a wellness center from now. And it's, it's part of Virtua's uh, network in New Jersey, but this is a healthcare building and it's a healthcare building about getting into the community and keeping their, their constituency healthy so they stay out of the hospital. Uh, specialty hospitals, you, you see a lot of. This is our project, CRGA for uh, uh, the schemes for Kennedy Krieger downtown for, um, for the kids there. And then uh, Eric's project, which, and this is, a, this is a trend, and as you heard from his introduction, we're particularly intrigued and we're looking forward to working with Eric and his team on this whole model of of using healthcare as a, as a catalyst for uh, design and for urban interventions, new neighborhoods, and how that how that connects them to community as well. And I'm sure Eric's going to tell us more about this project as well. And finally, what's the future hold? Well, um, I still believe that most healthcare is going to take care at home, take care or be taken care of in the house in the future. Not that we're going to lose our jobs so much. But um, hospitals are going to become essentially multi-story ICU units, going to be for the sickest of the sick. And it's, it just makes sense. You want to do, you want to take healthcare into the least expensive environment you can and have it be as equitable and as accessible as it can to the greater population. And actually what's going to, you'll end up wearing healthcare, right? So uh, they've already got products out where it's sewn in your clothes now and takes your vitals and stuff. So healthcare is... It's, it's, when I say what's old is new again, certainly from the wellness perspective, but probably where we're really going is healthcare is going to become much more personal. And I think by that nature, it is going to be much more equitable as long as those populations have access to the technology and are able to use that. So that's a brief history of healthcare. <laughs> and what I want to do then is, is uh, turn it over to my, my and just throw out some questions. And actually, Eric, I want to start with you, since um, I think this this concept of healthcare as a as an incubator, in a sense, for uh, communities, and how how that you think gets the gets the healthcare closer to the customer in terms of that social equity. Does that work? Yes. Good. Um, yeah, so it's interesting. What we're taking a look at is um, really developing a model that looks at hospitals um, and sort of understands that um, our kind of healthcare expenditures make up something like 5% of the U.S. economy. Um, actually, not just generally healthcare, but hospitals in particular. Um, so that's a, that's a very big number. Um, and they tend to be the largest employers in most places, most towns. 
Um, and yet they tend to be kind of isolated. That's, that's not, there are exceptions to that, of course, especially in urban areas. But generally speaking, they tend to kind of be isolated by themselves. And even if they're not, the buildings tend to be in the middle and the parking or the garages tend to kind of circle the hospitals themselves. Um, so um, some of this kind of thinking started um, certainly with other folks. And um, for us, it started with a client who, it's a really sad story, but I'll try to keep it real brief. Um, they, had a, they had a daughter that died at the Westchester Medical Center. Um, and their experience there, I'll say, was not, um, was not a great one, they didn't think. Um, but sort of dealing with that tragedy, they, they raised the money to build a new children's hospital, and they built the children's hospital. So now fast forward, and they sort of said, you know, one of the things that we find here is that what happens with these families that come and they have no, um, you know, th there's no way to take a break, right? Where do you go? You go to the parking lot. Um, you go to the cafeteria that's in the building. Um, and they sort of said, you know, it'd be great to have a better environment than that. Um, and so it sort of started with that. The second part of it is um, kind of education. And they sort of said, well, we really need to sort of teach people how to be healthy to begin with, to not end up in the hospital. Um, and so um, what we're doing with them and the project that you saw, you saw up on the screen is in essence immediately adjacent to the hospital is basically developing a compact mis mixed use uh, walkable community. And so that's really about saying that, you know, what happens from the perspective of the user, but also what happens with the employees at the hospital. So we know that we have this, um, this aging population and we know that there's great demand for nurses, and yet, you know, they have a lot of choices about where to work. And so when we go out there um, and they're competing for those nurses, they're sort of saying, well, how can we compete? Well, one of the ways that you can compete is by creating a really great working environment, right, where you're not sort of isolated. You're out, you're in essence working in the community. The other thing that you can do is provide housing opportunities, right? When you work at a hospital, you've got the whole income spectrum, and so providing sort of hospital and um, convenient ways for people to get to work. So rather than sort of commuting across, you know, an hour um, getting to work, being able to kind of, um, you know, live, work, play all kind of in one place. Um, so uh, when you talk about health equity, um, one of the things that I think really helps here is in urban areas, um, sometimes the hospitals tend to be in kind of a distressed area. And so when, when you do that, um, all of the spending potential that hospitals have, if you can direct them, um, a lot of places, um, not a lot, some places, have sort of started looking at this and saying, how can we help these communities? And we can help by um, recognizing that we're spending a lot of money. Let's target our spending into the community. Let's build capacity. Let's help people start businesses. And let's purchase from them. Um, let's provide educational opportunities because we need employees. So let's provide programs that help, um, help the community, but it's also helping the hospital. And so I think that there are tremendous opportunities in health equity. And then the last thing I'll say um, really has to do with, we've all heard that the biggest predictor of our health and mortality is our zip code, right? right. So uh, in that respect, um, I think it's really about um, making sure that other people have those opportunities, those economic opportunities, because that's probably going to be one of the big predictors in helping you increase your, your health. So from our perspective, um, separate from the hospital uh, critical care, it's about helping people not get sick in the first place and sort of and to live healthy lives. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I just uh, wanted to add on to your, the idea of, of community enrichment in a sense. Uh, Cleveland Clinic has this wonderful program through the Evergreen Group that, for instance, if you, if you were to have a laundry for a hospital, right, you had it all inside, well, they, they figured out, well, what if we outsource the laundry? And instead of just sending it down the road, what they did was they set up family businesses to take over laundry, and then those became self-sustaining businesses in the community, and they would supply the clean laundry to the hospital. So it was a great model. Yeah. And they did the same thing with solar energy. So yeah. very cool. Tracy, I wanted to ask you uh, at Chi, what are how, how what are you guys doing in terms of of getting in the community and the wellness initiatives? Yeah, so um, 
Chi Healthcare is um, it's wonderful. Of course, I'm not biased. Um, <laughs> combination of the best of what we think of in Western medicine, allopathic care, and other healing traditions. So in addition to going to your primary care doc, we have chiropractic care, acupuncture, massage, energy medicine, nutrition, naturopathic doctor. So, I mean, it's really sort of a, a one-stop when it comes to creating a, a very team-based way of um, getting your care, both assessment and, and treatment. We really value natural approaches to care. Um, you know, when you talk about life expectancy, uh, lifestyle actually is one of the top variables that predicts longevity. And so we, how we help with the community is we provide free one-on-ones. We just have community night, or we'll have a topic on allergies and supplements, or we'll have a topic, whatever our patients are coming in with, uh, some of them du jour of the day, right? So. Um, and that lets them know what's available, and it lets them know that they can come in and, um, and get the care. Fantastic. Uh, Ray, so you control quite a bit of the healthcare dollars in the state. I'll put it I don't control way. anything. <laughs> well. talk, to, talk to us a bit about uh, Trivergent and also some of the grants that you've been successful lately in landing and, and how... Uh, how much value there is to your, to your constituency with that? Well, there's a lot of waste in healthcare. Um, there's a lot of du duplicative services that are rendered. Um, you go into the ED, you get a lab test, you go up to, you're admitted to the unit, you get another lab test, you can have the same test done over again. Um, so there is a redundancy that occurs. And uh, you may have tests that were done in your physician's office space as well and that's not transmitted to the hospital. So you have this whole um, potential where you could have the same test done over four times and it not actually contribute to your improvement in your health at all, other than what could have come out of the first one. What, um, what we've done with Trivergent is we've looked at spending, where hospitals spend their most dollars. Now you have to remember, when you talk about healthcare and hospitals, you have to remember the social determinants of health. And that is 20% of your health is driven by the care you receive from the healthcare system. 80% is driven by your DNA, your lifestyle, whether you smoke or not, where you live, your zip code, uh, and your life choices. So you're, you hear a common theme here. We have to teach people how to live and how to live right. Um, and so we've spent and gotten grants from the Cost Review Commission in Maryland to actually look at the, there is a certain portion of our population, a very small portion, that drives most of the health care costs. There are 70,000 Medicare recipients in the three counties in Western Maryland. And um, about 1,500 to 2,000 of them can drive $80 million in costs a significant amount of money in just a small group of people with multiple chronic conditions who, if you connect with a caregiver, who, if you can show them the path and where to get their care or how to help manage their care, um, we'll, we've been able to reduce in a cohort population of about 1,500 people about $30 million in health care costs since 2014 through 2017. It's not. Um, it's not um, something that's well done across this nation. It is something that we could all learn from and all of our hospitals could learn from. It's not what's rendered within the four walls, it's what's rendered outside of the four walls. As, as Rolf did so eloquently in his presentation, he talked about you know, um, what we always thought was in the four walls of the hospital is now rendered throughout the community. The other thing we've done on a not so elegant scale is we do a lot of bidding for hospitals. We bring 10 hospitals together, we bid drug eluding stents, we bid uh, third party administration services for employee health care benefits, we bid medical supplies, we bid drugs, and so on. And um, for the three hospitals in Western Maryland, um, we've projected a savings of about $130 million over seven years. 
just by coming together, focusing together, and getting the physicians to agree on which implants they're going to use, and getting them to agree on clinical protocols for how care is delivered, and making sure we have antibiotic discipline. Um, because uh, the super germs are now growing, and if you read anything about it, uh, we now have a disease that we can't treat anymore. The fungus. And there's a fungus, that's right. And so um, it's clinical protocols, it's managing care, um, and, and you know, we're going to end up in a place where we're gonna have to decide is it standardization or innovation? Um, there, I, I, I truly believe there's a, a large amount of healthcare which can be standardized and rendered the same way. Many doctors would disagree with that, but it, it is possible. And then there will be the creative, innovative idea that if you implement it, can cut out a whole lot of unnecessary care. There are a lot of drugs that are coming onto the market that are matched with your DNA. Um, and those drugs can, if used properly, and if you qualify for their use, could go a long way in improving your lifestyle. Uh, I'll stop there. All right. So Eric, let's, let's get, as the architect on the panel with me, let's talk a bit about how architecture itself is a conduit for that and how, how it helps. I mean, Ray talked about the importance of getting into the community for what we call the, the high users, the, you know, the, the, the 5%, right, that drives about what, maybe 40% of health care 60, 60 or 70, oh my God. Um, how, do you, how can we as architects with our designs make, make health care more accessible and so that people actually are not intimidated and want to come to this? Um, so I guess I would answer that in two parts. Okay. The first part is I would say that, um, as you were saying, Right. Most of our health, sure, our genes have a role in that, but it's actually a pretty small role. It's really mostly, you know, 50% of it is basically our behaviors, another 20% of it is our environment. And so I think the first thing that we can do is start by understanding that there are a lot of studies that have been done out there already that show that when you have certain behaviors, well, let me back up a little bit. So um, $2.7 trillion a year is what is spent due to chronic health conditions. That's 86% of our healthcare expenditures. Think about that, 86%. So I usually start this one presentation that I do, and I say, <clears throat> today we're gonna find, we're gonna talk about the key to solving the healthcare crisis in the United States. And I say, how many people think we're gonna find that? Nobody raises their hand, right? <laughs> but the truth is that if we did away with the chronic diseases in the United States, would we really have a healthcare crisis? Um, so what's interesting is that chronic diseases are the most preventable out of all the diseases. Um, so really it starts with how can we get people to um, improve their behaviors? So what are some of the things that you can do? You can get out and walk, right? It's about physical activity. So I'm sure you've probably heard, um, you may have heard the tagline that says, sitting is the new smoking, yeah. right? So it's get out there and be active. The CDC has recommendations for levels of activity where you start to see significant health benefits. So um, what we find, we actually did, um, we de developed a tool that's based on the research that's been done about people's behavior, depending on where they live, and then that ties behavior to medical outcomes. And so we did a case study where you can basically take a mixed-use walkable compact community and you compare that to conventional suburban development, both built about the same time. Um, and you look at that and it shows you the reductions in chronic disease rates that you have based solely on the physical design of the community, right? So these are things like how big are the blocks? Is it walkable? Are there grocery stores? Are there chain grocery stores? How much open space is there? How far is the open space from different houses? Um, are there street trees? Um, so are there a mix of uses? And how far is it away from all of the houses? And so you find that you have significant, significant impacts and changes in the amount of chronic diseases that occur 
simply based on the physical design of the community. And this has been played out. The studies have been done that show that when, um, when people moved from one community to another community, that you saw significant increases in walking, for example. Um, so I think that the first thing as designers that we can do is we can start to think about the fact that we do impact people's behavior, and then that can have um, significant repercussions um, in the outcome of, of, um, of health. Yeah. <coughs> sort of as someone who oversees healthcare to the E out in the design world and architects, um, you know, if you just getting down to the minutia of the design of the actual space in which you're going to take care of people, you think about healthcare equity, right? Is the absence of health disparities, right? And as we improve those disparities, that's sort of our metric that we're making progress in healthcare equity. The only way you do that is to focus on those groups who aren't having equal access to care. Whether it's access to finding the space, equal assessments, equal treatment. And we know that that varies. So paying attention to culture. A really fine point of that is the size of an exam room. If you have patients who come from other cultures, they may bring other people with them into the exam room. And if they cannot, they may not come for care. And so just paying attention to those things that are true for the patients for whom the facility is going to care for is really important. Uh, just one more thing. Um, the, the other thing that people don't tend to think about is privacy. Um, how you check in how you're asked questions, how you're checking out. Uh, people feel bad when they get that label, when they get that diagnosis. They don't want everyone else to hear about it. Um, they don't want everyone else to hear their lab results. So making sure there's private places to have those conversations. <coughs> Excuse me, um, just getting over being sick. Uh, uh, it's also important to have private places when someone hears bad news that they can kind of collect themselves before then, then they have to walk through the waiting room and everyone's looking at them because their eyes are puffy, right? Those are all design issues, right? And, and, and really important. How many of us really like having our weight taken in the hallway, right? It's really easy. Just put a simple scale in the exam room. And so those are kinds of things that we might not think about, but when we're talking about design are really important for the people getting the care. We've, t we've talked so many times about that scale issue over the last few weeks. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say also at the, at the neighborhood scale, I think that the move, the move to sort of having smaller facilities in the community is, is really significant. And the reason for that is because when you look at distressed communities, um, there are transportation challenges that people have. Um, it's really hard for people sometimes to even get to their job. And so the, to then add another layer onto that to say, well, now you have to find a way to get somewhere else, um, it becomes very difficult. It becomes an obstacle, right? And we all know how some days we, we sit here and we think, ah, oh, it's such a hassle. I'm just not going to do that today. Um, and so just being able to have it in the community um, is a huge leap because it makes it very accessible to people. Ray, could you, I want you to follow up a bit on that, the dispersion into the smaller clinics. Um, for instance, in, in your larger system, how you've been getting health care more into those smaller community clinics? We, um, with our $3 million grant, we hired about 40 people who just go into the physician's office. Um, and they could be um, master degree social workers. Um, or they could just be health care workers, quote unquote, not even of a high degree. Um, of course, when we started doing that, the physicians all said, don't put them in my office because now you're adding more overhead to my practice and you're going to want me to pay for it. And most doctors are employed today, primary care physicians are, because they don't get paid enough to actually make money on their own. So they're employed. And so we said, no, no, we're not going to charge it to the overhead of your practice. We're just going to put them there. And what we want you to do is refer your patients to these healthcare workers who are the most complex patients. And the doctors have embraced it, and they wanted us to double the number 
of employees that we hired for that purpose because we only had them Monday and Wednesday maybe, and they wanted them Monday through Thursday because of the number of patients and the fact that once the doctor, so doctors are paid on 15 minute increments. I mean, let's face it. So if they get a really complex patient who needs an hour of time, the doctor is significantly losing money. Okay, so you have to put yourself in the physician's shoes who's being told that they have to see on the order of four patients an hour, eight hours a day, or maybe nine hours a day, right? Five days a week. That's, that's where they're at. So they really look forward to the support that they get from the care workers in the office or the master degree social worker who can deal with the patient with the complex mental health issues that that doctor may not even be trained to deal with. I mean, because he's a primary care physician, an internist, not necessarily a psychiatrist. But in any event, and there are not enough psychiatrists, I mean, we've been trying to put together a mental health program from Salisbury, Maryland to Cumberland, Maryland for the last two and a half years, and we don't have enough providers. We just don't, it, it is, it's very frustrating. And we have an opioid crisis beyond belief. I mean, we get, we get uh, patients who overdose multiple times a night now. We have patients um, who overwhelm our emergency departments because of the opioid crisis. And yet, we can't get our state and we can't get our healthcare system to create the resources necessary to, the, and, and it's eating up a dollar. Do you know how much a, a, an emergency room visit costs? I did this uh, speech for high school students in a number of high schools across Maryland, and I said, how much does it cost for somebody to die, you know, come in with an overdose in our ED, right? So that's, that's usually about $1,500 for an overdose. And then they may go back and they may overdose again. And let's talk about how many people over, we have 130,000 people a year who die from their addictions. I mean, we're, we're sitting up here talking about how can we improve life and improve health equity. Let's start by addressing chronic disease. Opioid addiction is a chronic disease. Why don't we face it? It's, it's not a choice. Because once you've taken the drug, you're hooked. You've got to find a way to come off of it. It's something we as a society are not dealing effectively with. But so we've begun to put, the answer, going back to Ralph's question, we've begun to put people into primary care physicians' offices. We're taking patients and we're having them fill out a, just a nine question questionnaire to identify what is their underlying mental health condition and whether or not they have an addiction problem. And if they're honest, that we get them started in treatment, because if you treat them early, we'll treat them early, then we can treat them effectively. Recognizing that anybody who wants to kick their habit has to want to do it. You can't force them. They have to agree to do it. It's putting people it's putting care where the patient is. It's putting it into the community. It's reaching out and it's not requiring them. You know, the hospitals used to be a place that sat on a hill. They literally sat on hills because they were worried about floods, right? We know that in Western Maryland very well. But it's putting caregivers next to the patients in the community where you can reach them the best and educating them. Uh, did I answer that question? Yes, really quickly. <laughs> Go ahead, Go ahead Tracy. So I started my career, I'm a psychologist by training, carried a caseload. I've always worked in medical settings. And I will tell you that folks with mental health issues go to their primary care doc many, many, many more times than they will go to a specialist. So where people with mental health issues, including substance abuse issues, show up is in primary care. And if we don't have the space. Um, space is a big deal. When I, I lived in the FQHC, federally qualified health centers, community health centers world for a long time. And what I would talk with people about, I focused a lot of my work on integrating behavioral health and primary care. They would talk, well, we don't have the space to put anyone. We can't, we're, we're going to sit in the waiting room. We don't, we don't have, so 
as people design that space, it's really important to think about what are the support services for the physician, for the patients, but for us to meet them where they are. And having behavioral health in primary care is meeting people where they are. The opposite is also true. One of the most marginalized group are people with mental illness. They have some of the shortest life expectancies. We get a lot of chronic illness chronic illnesses in addition to their mental illness, and it's hard for them to seek health care. And so having actual primary care in the mental health facility, it goes both ways, can also be another way to address it. Tracy, let's stay with you for mm -hmm. a while. Tracy and I met in her previous life when she was with Chase Brexton uh, down in downtown Baltimore, and she and I went through a lot of planning together. Um, tell me some of the, the uh, challenges that you face and from a facility standpoint in, in, in essentially trying to manage that underserved population in a, in a large urban area. How much time do we have, <laughs> often? Um, challenges. So every facility has to make decisions on where they're going to spend their money. And we are becoming more and more dependent on technology. We haven't talked about electronic health records, telemedicine, all of that technology costs a lot of money. And so healthcare facilities, the CFOs, the folks who are controlling the purse strings, have to make decisions about where they're going to get their return. Sometimes having the extra art on the wall Nice desks, nice chairs, so that patients feel respected. I won't take a lot of time, but we had um, redone a, um, an IOP for our addictions patients, uh, intensive outpatient program where they come every day. And we didn't spend a lot, but we made it nice. I mean, the colors were nice. There was some nice music. We had tea. We had nice chairs to sit in. And the comments from the patients were like, what? We're addicts. What? We've never seen anything like this. They were completely surprised, which made us all kind of cry, because that's a really sad comment. Just the smallest bit of dignity for them. The smallest, exactly, exactly. I mean, put, putting a little, now we've got all this technology, you can put little pods, you can put little music out. It makes people feel like it is a healing environment. I mean, how do you feel when you walk into any space, any room? this place, right? When you go into a restaurant, we're all paying attention to how we feel, how something make, you know, oh, I sense some energy here, right? We all say those things. Well, the same is true when you walk into a doctor's office. I mean, everything from the color to the shape of things to movement, how things smell, it can either raise your blood pressure or it can relax you and help you feel like, okay, I'm in a safe place, it's going to be okay. That's where the healing process starts, when the person walks through the door. And so uh, that's kind of an umbrella of all the things that uh, we talked about, Ralph, but it's really creating that space and that feel. That's great. So Eric, um, I, did, I did want to oh, jump oh, in. Okay, took, right. I did want to <laughs> jump in on the privacy issue, um, because we found at Meredith when it was built, we went to all single rooms. And it was amazing. Um, people tended to bring their families with them. They tended to have conversations, better conversations about their care. Doctors rounded faster because they only went into a room to see the patient that they had cared for it, and they didn't get caught in another conversation with another patient who was in the room who you know, may not have been on their list of patients they had around on that day, but they saw them and they were going to be friendly. And the patients got a better understanding of their care. And most of the patients who are in the hospital who are Medicare patients cannot remember what the doctor told them. So they usually, and they should, bring someone with them so they can listen and understand what the discharge instructions are and how to be cared for, what they have to do when they get home, what drugs do they have to take, and what is their diet. And so you're having telling that you single have, room. Have some space for that. <laughs> and, and yes, we need that. Right. We need that space and you need that single room concept so you invite the whole family into the care of the patient. I'm done.
<laughs> and the one, I just want to add one more thing, and that's really the importance of green space. Um, you know, I'm sure you've probably heard that having the presence, the, vis the visibility of seeing green space has a significant effect on how people um, recover. And so that's certainly at the kind of building level, that's an important thing. And I think also at the neighborhood level, when you talked about depression and anxiety, um, when you have certain amounts of open space and certain distances, you find significant reductions in people that um, need to see care. Um, something like 30% reductions. I mean, those are huge. So don't, don't underestimate the importance of providing um, green space. Can you talk a bit about, I mean, one of the biggest challenges we face as healthcare architects is how rapidly the technology is changing. And, um, I mean, literally 18-month turnover of certain technologies. Uh, what are the challenges to you as an architect to create buildings that last generations that can still handle change like that? That's a great question. So uh, the <laughs> one, one thing I'll say, um, you probably have heard of um, well building and fit well, right? Much like LEED, it, it sort of um, now is sort of required by jurisdictions, right? And so I don't think that um, that well and fit well are there yet, but I think it's actually going to go in that direction. Um, and so I think that really designing healthy buildings that promote health um, are an important part of that. So as you said, technology changes, right, very quickly. But there are some things that sort of don't change, right? Our human bodies are not going to change. And so things like when you walk in the door, that the first thing you see is a set of stairs and the elevators down around the corner makes it more likely that you're going to go and you're going to walk up the stairs and get that physical exercise. And so I think that while there are technological changes, um, there's sort of the inherent things that are really about the human um, in designing buildings that are not going to really change. Yeah, I've got, I sort of kind of set myself up for that. I have this theory about what I'll call dumb buildings. Um, if, you, if you look at most uh, revitalized areas in most of our urban areas, they're typically the older warehouse areas that were, you know, some of the original catalysts for the city itself. Very simple buildings, usually 30 foot bay huge windows, tons of natural light in these things. They're, they, they're probably on their eighth or ninth reuse that is not their first use they ever had. Health, there's no reason healthcare can't be like that. And it, as technology advances in diagnostics and wearables and all of that, we really should, as architects, be able to get that technology out of the infrastructure of the building and into the things we put in the building. So I, I believe there's a huge amount of stock out there, of healthcare stock, that just isn't realized yet. And there's no reason to be spending $500 a square foot building some of these spaces. It, it's, uh, and again, and, and then the more universal that space is, the more adaptable it will be as you go forward. Yeah, we, we were working on a project where um, they were actually, they're moving the hospital, and so you're going to have this hospital building, right? right. You have the bed tower, and so the question becomes, well, what do you do with that? And you go and you look at it, and you say, well, what are the dimensions of this building? Uh, they don't quite work for adaptive reuse for what we want to do, right? And with the structure, and so I think you're right about the dumb buildings, right? Making them flexible so that they can adapt over time becomes really important. The other thing is um, when you look at hospitals with parking garages, so you're thinking, well, what about the parking garage, right? Well, what's going to happen in the future? Are we going to have as many cars? Are we going to need as many parking spaces with autonomous vehicles? And so what are you going to do with the money that you put into that garage? Making sure that you design the garage in a way that you can adapt that into another use. So for example, you know, you have rather than all your slopes um, you know, on the garage, you say, no, I'm going to do flat plate with a ramp. And that makes it much easier for me to come back later and change that building to another use. Well, most hospitals with the flat garages, that's their disaster relief area, yeah. right? So if there's a huge cataclysmic event, they can set up a mass unit in their garage eventually. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Ray, I, I wanted to talk with you a bit more about I mean, I know that the, the uh, opioid crisis in, in, in Western Maryland is, is really out of just out of control right now. It's all the way through the whole state. Can we I'm trying to get this wrapped back into our environments and how how the 
physical environment might be able to help that. Now, is, is there anything that you're doing at Trivergent from a facility standpoint to address that crisis right now? Uh, Trivergent really doesn't deal with facilities. Well, I know you don't. We, we don't deal with facilities. We, we support hospitals who right. put programs in place. And um, basically, you know, I can't emphasize more the fact that you need to identify it early. You need to put behavioral health counselors in the primary care offices for all the reasons that we talked about earlier. Um, in sort of the design of the facility, I would say that I would agree with both of my colleagues here, and that is that you need to make it welcoming. Uh, you need to make people feel like they're respected. You need a welcoming environment for people uh, to come into. Uh, you need to feel them, make them feel at ease when you're talking to them, um, because we have to remember we're not we're not parents who are here to chastise them. We are caregivers here who are help to heal them. We want to create a healing environment which is receptive. To the patient, which will have them engage in discussion and discourse, because communication will be ultimately um, the way that we will get this patient to move forward, so that they will understand what it is that they have to do in order to care for themselves and to want to be able to be take care of themselves. We need people to self-actualize. Um, they need jobs. They need good places to live. Um, you know, you were, you were talking about the whole environment. Look what Hopkins is doing on the east side of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've ripped down uh, virtually the entire part of the, the east part of Baltimore. They're putting like, up housing for their employees, and they're actually creating a, a program whereby the employees can get low-cost housing um, through their employment with Hopkins. I mean, they, you know, and, and creating green space and, you know, tearing down the old uh, porno movies and all the other stuff. That was going on in that neighborhood. That actually, and, and that's, actually improving. That's a great. That's a great point. Is in most of these community hospitals throughout the country, they're the largest employer in their they in their are. area, and to and to be able to empower their their employees, their their staff, to be able to create have a you know, essentially a living wage and help them get housing. That's all part of that community health. It's terrific. I actually believe that. Uh, Having been involved with a lot of hospitals as I have for many, many years, that you need the executives of the hospital to live in the community. If you have a CEO who's driving 60 miles a day to come to work and go back, they're not part of the community. What you need is someone who lives in the community, who stops on the way home at the grocery store and runs into employees or patients who, who get to know them. You need to be a part of the community. It's just like the whole idea about how do you want to have better um, police force in your community. Have the police officers live in the community that they are providing security for. You need to be part of the community and, part of, and actually be part of some of the activities that go on in the community, Optimus Club, Bear, whatever the animal clubs are that are out there, you know, be part of the, right? The be part of the community and interact with people, the, the moose, moose the whatever it is. <laughs> you need to go and be there. Optimus, the Rotary, you need to be right there. Down. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Did I answer that? Yeah. Just to add one quick ahead, thing. There, we haven't talked, there's one issue that we haven't talked about, and we won't have a chance to really do it justice, but there's an issue of trust. And when you talk about healthcare inequities, trust is a big deal. I mean, having worked in Baltimore City, I can't tell you how many patients said, yeah, but are you really telling me the real thing? Are you, is this an experimental drug that you're doing? Like, are you, am I getting the real standard of care here? Maybe in a different language? And so, making sure that you pay attention to folks having good reason to question is important in creating that environment. So, Mohammed, we have a lot of smart people here. I thought I'd throw it out. Okay. So, yeah. So, just throw it out to the to the group here. Any questions for our panel? Yes. 
that. <laughs> so, a um, couple, couple of questions. One is, you, you mentioned um, standardization of the equipment that you may want to use, or transplants, or whatever, versus innovation. How, how does that really uh, give you the best care if you're standardizing a technology that may be life-saving or maybe innovative? Okay, so drug-eluting stents, would you not agree that putting in a drug eluting stent around your heart is very important, right? I, I think Mick Jagger would, didn't he yes. get one the other day? Yeah. Anyway. Um, I, I have six of them. There you go. So, so we did a bid with 10 hospitals on drug eluting stents. The first thing we did was we started with Abbott, Medtronic. We looked at all of the various brands and we looked at the quality outcomes associated with those brands and we could not find any difference. And yet one brand was charging twice what the others were. And we had doctors in the room. We had nine doctors in the room from these hospitals who were, and one doctor had actually used every single one of these stents and worked in four of the hospitals. And so they, they all came to agreement that there really was no difference. And so therefore, we could go out to bid and if we could commit to Abbott or Medtronic or one of those suppliers, that we would give 70%. Now, if you've, ha if you've had a couple, uh, as you have, you may find you don't want to change brands because there's, there may be some interaction. And there may be certain diseases um, that a patient has that may impact which stent that they want to use. And the doctors all agree to those. So they wanted to have some latitude where 30% of the stents were at the doctor's discretion, but they'll place 70% of them with one vendor. And we did that. And on, it happened, it's not a big deal. I mean, there was like eight, eight or nine million dollars in spend here among the hospitals, but we saved 20%. And then the, the company gave an incentive so that if the hospital, uh, hospitals would achieve an 80% volume level or a 90% volume level, they would even get a greater discount. And uh, that, it was just, uh, that's one example. I, I, I could go on and on about other examples, but that's one. Go ahead. One, one more quick question. It traces probably to your point about mental health, right? How much of uh, hesitancy or reluctance in patients who go see a therapist and they just not come to the insurance or the, uh, uh, you know, the provider? Yeah, fortunately, um, Medicare um, has mental health equity now, and so you, you, you can't get that difference. So it used to be for your somatic care would be 80%, 20% split, and mental health was 50-50. Well, that's, that's changed. Where it comes to be that it's such, um, I, I won't, won't use bad words, um, it's so difficult <laughs> to process insurance as a practitioner. It takes so much time and so much headache that many, many people are just not taking insurance anymore. And that's true for primary care. Folks, you're seeing a lot of folks go concierge. You're seeing a lot of folks. There's a new thing called direct primary care now, which is a monthly fee. It's it's because it's very difficult to do. That's that's one thing. I think maybe that answered your question. But another piece to that is sometimes the actual practitioner isn't comfortable asking the questions. You know, don't ask the question if you don't want to hear the answer. Right? So if you're not comfortable with someone saying, yes, I am suicidal today, you may not screen as well as you might for some other things. So a lot just doesn't go, it just doesn't get diagnosed. And that's part of the issue too. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank <laughs> you. 
actually, that is one of the few places that we're getting better. Um, I, because I totally agree. In fact, but but. But I was going to tell you, you're, you're right. In fact, the irony is that the healthcare environment probably gets away with the most. And it's, it, they're lax because they think they have so many resources there to take care of it. We're, all of the patient uh, exam rooms that we're doing now, we're actually not using beds anymore. We're using recliners that can come up to a bed height, but they can be lowered, you know, so all different ages. and. You know, it, and so we're, we're becoming much more attuned to that in these environments because honestly, that 1% you're talking about, all of my clients and certainly the, the, the board I serve on, that, that's going to come out as a negative in their age caps. And that's how they get paid, right? It's all about, it's all about the metrics and it's all about the outcomes. So we got 99% right, but that 1%, we, gotta get, we have to get that down. So you're right. Just to add to that, um, people who are challenged by their size have a very similar issue. Having chairs that they can sit in, scales that can actually weigh them, um, mm -hmm. it's a big deal. Because many hospitals have been retrofitted based upon the Hill Burton Act. A lot of the newer hospitals that are being built are much more handicapped accessible, or the replacement hospitals that are being built. I, that's a, my belief. More questions? Yes, sir. Are you finding um, with the advent of fentanyl kind of being introduced into the U.S. in the United States, uh, is, it's being, uh, having to be treated differently and you find different needs What, what, excuse, what's your question? It's about, uh, what, is fentanyl changing the way you're, you're treating people who are coming in with overdoses? Um, yes. Um, actually, the proliferation of the drugs in our community are causing many of us... Wasn't that where you get the three visits a day for the same person? I, I'm even okay. considering getting Narcon education and carrying it on my person mm -hmm. because I've seen people who have overdosed sitting in a car at a red light. Um, and so, and I didn't know what to do, and I felt inadequate when I saw that going on. So I'm, I'm considering doing that for myself. And maybe we should all do that, right? But I had a doctor recently that I had a long conversation with about why do you, why do doctors prescribe so much Oxycontin? And he said that in the 70s and 80s, when physicians were trained, they actually were trained that if you gave opiates to a patient who was in pain, they would not be addicted. It was actually part of their, their training, which is not true. Um, and many people are becoming addicted today when they're in high school on the athletic field and they need to have surgery for their meniscus. I had a long conversation with one of my employees today whose son plays um, lacrosse in uh, Macon, Georgia, on his college team. And he had surgery today for his torn meniscus. And he was agonizing over whether the doctor was going to prescribe his son Oxycontin because he didn't want his son to get addicted. Um, so we had a long discussion about how he, he might be able to avoid that. I, these are the kinds of discussions that need to go on within our society. Did I answer your question? <laughs> well, actually, Zach, you and I were just at some recently, and part of that training was that their outcome metric was, are you in pain? And they, it would have the smiley yes. face all the way down to the frowny right. face. And if they took the frowny face, then that, that it was a ding against you. So they were just trying to get rid of pain. But then the question was, how much pain do you need to get rid of? And it, 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 that was the way they were being judged. Some people lay it on the JCHO, who is at Western Maryland this right, week, right? They are. And, and, you know, they emphasized uh, elimination of pain. And so they felt that it was overemphasized by the accredit accrediting agencies who came into the hospitals 
right? And said, you need to eliminate pain. Yeah. And Rolf's right. How far do you go? Yeah. Mohammed, I'm going to make you ask a question because this is oh, what you okay. do. <laughs> Exactly right. If you have a caregiver who is, you know, I can remember talking to a group of physicians one time and saying, you know how to get better scores is actually sit down and ask the patient, how are you today? If you ever see doctors make rounds, I, observing them over the years, they do drive-by care. They walk into the room. They never sit down. They talk. They tell you everything they want you to hear, right? So there was a nurse. In, in training at, at Meredith one time, uh, she was doing her didactic. She was with uh, Hagerstown Community College. And she sat with the patient before the doctor came. And she, she listened to him ask all the questions that the patient wanted to ask the doctor. Then she waited. When the doctor came into the room, he came in and just told the patient what was going to happen. And he headed for the door. And the nurse goes, um, I have a question, doctor. And so she proceeded to then ask the doctor every single question the patient was afraid to ask. About the fourth question, he got it. And he stopped and he said, can I see you in the hallway? He goes down the hallway. He says to the nurse, he says, now, were you asking me all the questions that that patient wanted to ask? And she said, yes. And he goes, why didn't he ask him? And she said, because you're an overbearing physician. <laughs> and he's afraid of you. If you would bring your temperament down a couple notches and just sit down and ask the question. Right? That particular nurse doesn't do nursing anymore. She does acupuncture. <laughs> and she does massage therapy. Right, because that, she decided she didn't want to work in a hospital anymore. That, I mean, only, that only gets us off the hook for her first question, which was operational. Um, as far as the space is concerned, no, I'm, I'm, and that was very good, very good. I, 
Th those are mistakes that happen in planning that are, they happen, they're inexcusable. And I mean, I think a big message we got tonight from the panel is basic dignity as a, as a designer. Um, and I think that's the message about the, the social equity part of this is treating people equally, correct, right? And so bringing the same level of dignity to a patient no matter what. We as designers have to constantly be thinking about when we're doing our space planning, and you know, how, how are we making the best environment possible for the delivery of care for this person, and how are, we, and how are they gonna feel in that environment? It wasn't that long ago that really, well, I, I don't even know if the hospitals really felt that way. Um, it, it really wasn't a patient-centered approach to what we do. It was more like a volume-based approach, right? Heads in beds, and that's how you got your money. Thank God, Maryland's a whole different environment because we're the only cap totally capitated state in the country. And for those who don't know what that means, it means you get a pile of money and you gotta manage it. And, and the way you get more money next year is you do a better job this year, right? And it's all based on how you take care of patients. But, um, so I, I think it all comes down to being aware as designers of, of the space of that person and the dignity for that person. So I'm sorry that you had those experiences. I really am. And I don't know who the architect was, but I'll, maybe I'll talk to him for you. You want to do some QC for I, us, too? I, I, I have some questions because I know I'm an architect. And yeah. I'm like, I would never work <laughs> right. a door that gets constantly. And, and it's a double door that both open at the same time. I like how you jerry-rigged your own wall. <laughs> I'm an amazing. architect. I yeah, I love it. So, Mohammed? Yeah, I, I shared this story with, with Tracy uh, before this panel that during summer with a wonderful group of uh, students, we worked on an NIH ASEM project, which was kind of inspiring for this panel. Um, and for this project, we evaluated the impact of architecture on the healthcare uh, clinic, which is a small clinic here, probably two miles away from, from Morgan, which is Shepherd Clinic. I don't mm -hmm. know what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. And this is a kind of a small, modest uh, uh, clinic. And uh, in the beginning, probably the team, the, the, the assistants were kind of hesitant about, about the work, and then they realized that. Uh, how, how these kinds of facilities contribute to the, the health of the community. And then uh, the team, I mean, the, the assistants became totally kind of uh, involved emotionally with the, the project. And, uh, and my question um, for, for all four of you, because uh, this is a, a, a fabulous transdisciplinary team of uh, scholars and practitioners, that in reality, how can we, uh, we uh, spread, the, uh, how can we come up with, with the more kind of small scale clinics that can make an impact in the community? Because in reality, what we have in the US, and again, more specifically in USA, is actually mainly big hospitals, and that's it. And the hospitals are trying to work with the company. In reality, the, the, the clinics mostly exist either in some, some urban areas and, in, and they, they function in, in rural areas. Mm -hmm. And they are mostly effective in rural areas. And most of them, they deal with the major economic crisis. So most of them, they don't have enough budget to take care of themselves. But, but, and I know that the question that I'm asking doesn't have uh, uh, much to do with architecture, but more to do with, with economy and decision making process. But how can we change the way that we look at things when it comes to uh, healthcare? Are you ready or do you want me to jump up to say one That's thing. actually something that you started. Yeah, so um, there's a project that we worked on in Wyandanche, New York. Um, strange name, but it's the second poorest community on Long Island. And so one of the things that, that existed there was that there was this health clinic, and it was not a nice building. It was in the middle of a parking lot. It was in a strange kind of location. 
And so the one of the catalyst projects here was actually to create a new um, neighborhood square. Um, it had a new transit station, and it had new um, retail with residential over it. And so when we sat there looking at this, we said, well, what do we do about this health clinic? Right? We're looking for uses to sort of make up this space, the central feature. And so um, working with the supervisor, um, the county supervisor, um, we talked about basically saying, well, what if we took this health clinic and it really became a wellness center, right? It still has some of those clinic functions, but it, you then team up with, with the YMCA. Um, and so where do you put that? It's gonna go at the very head of the space. So that's currently under design right now. And so this is something that now, rather than being kind of back away, it really becomes a central focus of the community, and it's really about um, prevention, right? It still has the clinical aspect to it, right? But it's, it just, it's just viewed more holistically within the community and as more of a kind of key central feature of the community. Go, okay. Jason. Two thoughts off the top of my head. Um, the first is community health centers actually are in a great position to have smaller clinics because then they can have some economies of scale. All the other things in the overhead can kind of stay at the, the mothership, so to speak, and then you can have other clinics. And so that's one way to get smaller. Another way to get smaller is to lose our connection with brick and mortar for a second and think about technology and innovation and actually seeing people when they're not in the same space through telemedicine. You can have a very small, efficient office with large screens to see lots of different people who can't quite get to you when they need to get to you at the time, but maybe can follow up next week. So you can have some exam rooms. Being able to leverage telemedicine, I think, is part of the answer going forward. We've, uh, I agree with I, that was my answer as well. It's, tel it's telehealth, it's telemedicine. We have, you know, we have not increased the number of doctors coming out of medical school. So we're having the same number of specialists, but our population's grown. And so you, you run into a situation where the expertise you need is uh, not readily available. So uh, we, have, we already have, um, we already have these tele-ICUs that are in place around Maryland already, where you can have an ICU and you can monitor patients from a central location, and you can monitor three and 400 ICU beds. Typical hospital, not a Hopkins or a university, but a typical community hospital may only have 20 or 30 uh, ICU beds. So you could monitor 10 hospitals, ICU beds from one location with a team. You may have one um, in, intensely trained physician and a number of nurses in that particular area. We, we have hospitals in Maryland, um, the one in Hagerstown, where I worked many years, has a relationship with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, the, there's not enough neurologists. So strokes, there's five, 600 strokes a year that come into Hagerstown, into that hospital, and there's only three neurologists, okay? And there's, that's just not enough coverage because with a stroke, it's a golden hour. You need to treat that patient within the first hour. So you bring the patient into the ED, you hook them up, and you communicate with UPMC, and you pick up a neurologist who sees the patient, can uh, visualize the patient, can talk to the patient, can't touch them because they're in two separate locations, but sees all the vital signs coming across, and then they can prescribe. I mean, those telemedicine, and right now we don't have a very good system for paying for telemedicine. I know, I know LifeBridge, Adventist, and, and Peninsula Regional, and the hospitals of Western Maryland struggle to get paid for a telemedicine consult. There are a number of insurance companies who don't pay for it at all. And um, uh, to give the state of Maryland its due, the Medicaid program has now begun to set up uh, a charge and a fee and a payment for a telemedicine service. Um, and I think Aetna or United has set one up. It's, it's equivalent to a, a specialty care visit 
in a doctor's office, maybe 40, 50 bucks or something like that. And I, but in any event, I, I think telemedicine could go a long way to helping us out, particularly when you're trying to get care in the rural communities where you just can't get the specialists that you need. And uh, once again, by, by no means I'm questioning the significance of telemedicine in terms of the, the impact that it can have. Uh, however, I think there is this humanistic touch yeah. that yeah. should not be forgotten yeah. in this process. Yeah. And this is something that when we were working on this uh, facility, we realized that there were many people who were, in, in some cases, who were just coming back to the facility just because they were feeling very connected to, to, yeah. to, the, to the caregivers. And that part is really important. Telemedicine is a diagnostic tool like an MRI. It's not a long-term treatment, but it's not a long-term relationship. So I would agree with you. We've got a project right now that I can't tell you about because I have an NDA on it. But I'll tell you about it in about a year. And it involves several small clinics, not like 4,000 square feet. So it's exactly what you're talking about. And it's dispersing into the community. So um, you're right on it. You're, it's exactly the way to get a higher touch to that to that community. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, well, it's kind of related. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking again more about um, non-traditional healthcare environments, to, um, other typologies, schools, and the other. Mm -hmm. other you talked a lot about technology, repurposing retail space, that sort of thing. But what are some other either um, opportunities or barriers uh, to really get into communities and provide more equity, maybe in some non-traditional um, healthcare environments? That's a good question. I think it, it gets down to get back to that discussion I was having about repurposing um, warehouse space for the most part. There's, I don't, I, I, there's very little that would prevent a stable building from becoming a healthcare facility in my mind. Yeah, um, it but it would depend on the acuity of care that you're delivering in that environment. Um, the brief history lesson I gave, almost everything through history is all about fresh air and coming through. Actually, what's ironic is our hospitals are all sealed up. In Britain, they're still using fresh air. You can still operate windows in, in, the, in the British Isles. But I, I think as long as it's a sound building, and can support infrastructure being brought into it in, in, in a modular way. I don't think there's anything that would prevent any building from becoming a provider of health care, really. I'm going to just comment on something with that. If we can take away, we're talking about health care is after the fact, after someone's sick. We haven't talked about preventative health care. And when I heard your question, that's what I heard. Right? And so, do the kids have healthy snacks at school? Do restaurants offer vegetarian options or non fried options? You know, there's this study that was done that um, people spend 90% of their time within five miles of where they live. And if there are six or more fast food restaurants within a half a mile of where you live, there's a 40% chance that person will become obese than three. And obesity is driving a lot of our chronic illnesses. So this is, this is a big deal. Baltimore, we all have heard about the food deserts. Very difficult to talk to someone about their health care when everything they eat comes out of a bag. It's very difficult. And so the more we can actually give people the opportunity to have healthy fruit, healthy vegetables, whole grains, you know, the kind of diets that we know lead to, to good health. And will be. Yes. I don't want to sound too much like Bernie Sanders, but uh, given that we're the only industrialized country in the world that doesn't guarantee health care as a right, mm -hmm. and we spend twice as much as the as OECD countries on health care, <coughs> what's with that? <laughs> um, well, you're speaking to the choir here, is what people that know me. I, I actually think I, I think two basic rights are health care and education. You know, I think I think it's only fair that 
a citizen should have a chance to have a good education. Not, not the most expensive one, not, but just to have a basic education. And during that time period, you should have free health care. I think you should. I think it's a, I do think it's a human right. Um, we pay, I, I, they talk about the taxes in other countries, but you talk to those people and their quality of life, they're happy, they're, you know, I mean, it's so, you know, it's good. I talked about, there's concierge medicine from the beginning of history, and we still have concierge medicine, right? And so that's what I fear now, is that there's, there's becoming two tiers of healthcare delivery in this country. And it's, it, it just, it doesn't seem right that because you don't have as much money as your neighbor that you get worse health care. So I'm not a Bernie guy, but I got that. <laughs> two, two comments, if I might, for you. One, one is uh, any of the time I've done charts to look at health care costs, the costs between us and the other developed countries of the world are pretty, pretty similar until you get to age 55. Then in the U.S., it shoots off the map. And the rest of them kind of go up gradually. And so we spend a lot more money for people who are of Medicare age. Part of it is that we have extravagant expectations. That's one. And that is, as a society, we expect to be able to fix everything and to have the best of everything. We don't deal with hospice care very well in this society. Um, we don't deal with end of life. Read the book, you know, Being Mortal by Alto Gwandi. It's fantastic. Look at that book, yeah. read that. It's a very good book. Um, and the other thing that is kind of embarrassing to me is if you look at the quality of health care in this country, we're not at the top for all the money that we spend. We're average. We're not even average. We're below average. We're, and, and so, uh, you know, why is that? What is it that we could do? Because we don't know how to wash our hands in the hospital, for example. It's the little things. It's, it's what this lady was saying a minute ago. It's, you know, not knocking on the door, not showing respect. You know, there are a lot of things that we could do better in delivering the care when we're with the patient. Just as an example, so the Bloomberg Global Index report just came out where they assess 169 countries and rank them in terms of healthiest. Any idea who won? No, it wasn't us. Just guess? No. No. They're all in the top 10. All of those countries are in the top 10. Spain was number one. Italy was number two. And last year, they were opposite. The two factors that they identified that made them a healthier population was their lifestyle. Losing. That they moved, they walked naturally, right? They just walked around. They just moved a lot. They didn't have a lot of machines to help them do the things. They did them themselves, and they ate healthy diets, mainly a Mediterranean diet. So you're just describing blue zones, if you guys are aware of those as well. So, yeah. so let's all go to Barcelona. Please. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> so? <laughs> uh, it's a uh, being mortal by Alto Guandi. It's fabulous. And Dr. Guandi is now the head of the, uh, what's the group? It's called Haven. Haven. It's the group that uh, the really rich guy in America put together with two other companies. <laughs> Berkshire, Berkshire, yeah, there you go. Amazon and J.P. Morgan have just come together to create a new health system. It's called Haven. And Dr. Guandi is the new CEO of this new organization. You know, that's that the disruptor. Yep, news is disruptors. Okay. All right, sir. Any other questions? One quick question. You had mentioned that the um, the number of graduates coming from medical school is not keeping up with the, I guess, the demand and the increase in population. Can you speak to this? why do you think that is? Because the medical schools restrict the number of graduates. They, they set a quota. This is how many pediatricians we're going to have. This is how many neurosurgeons we're going to have. They do that. I guess, I guess why would they restrict it? It's because, okay, so I'm not trying to be, not being too political here. It's because they are, um, what did they call those in England many, many years ago? They're a guild. And the guild, it restricts access. And that way, 
there will, there will only be so many neurosurgeons. There will only be so many heart surgeons. But also the problem is primary care versus specialists. And the number of primary care doctors yes. is decreasing. I mean, it's, it's horrible. It, in the world, the, it's 70% primary care to 30% specialists. And I believe it's the exact opposite, opposite in America. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the problems. Yeah. So, all right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. everybody.